Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Metziah Daf Kuf Yud Zayin. Almost, almost there at the end. Today's stuff is sponsored by the Hadron Women of Long Island in honor of the birth of a granddaughter, daughter of Eliza and Cheski Gewurz, to our friend and co-learner Dina Rabinovich. Rabinovich. May the Rabinovich and Gewurz family see much nachat as the new Hadron Daf edition grows to Torah and Daf, Kupa and Masim Tovim. And may the Simcha bring joy, peace, and healing to the Jewish nation and the world. Mazal tov. Okay, last chance, or almost last chance to register for the Siyum. So the Siyum, again, in, in Israel, there's a bunch of Siyumim happening either Tuesday night um, or some of them in other nights. There's one in Jerusalem, there's one in Modi'in. I'll be at the one in Modi'in if anyone wants to come. Um, Dr. Leavis, Rabbani, Dr. Leah Wiesel will be speaking as well about the importance and the centrality of, of the Nizikin, Seder Nizikin in our daily lives. And um, and the English Seum will be happening on Wednesday, um, which might be Wednesday morning, might be Wednesday afternoon, might be Thursday morning, early in the morning for you, depending on where you're living. So everyone is welcome to join. It's a Zoom, so get your Zoom link through the registration link. If you can't find it, it's on our homepage, right front and center. Okay, looking forward to seeing you there. There we'll hear from Dr. Alana Steinhain and from Elaine Gottesman, one of our learners. Okay, enough introductions. We're going to get started with our DAF. So there's a study guide for today. Um, recommended. You can use it to help. There's a bunch of charts that chart out things that we're going to be learning. Okay, what was our topic? We had this Mishnah, which we didn't explain well enough what exactly the Machloket is, and today we're going to have a few different opinions about what exactly the Machloket is between Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in our Mishnah. Our Mishnah has a case where there's a landlord and a tenant. The landlord lives downstairs, the tenant lives upstairs, and there's a hole in the floor of the of the t- the tenant's floor. So according to Tanakama, the landlord is fully responsible. And if the landlord doesn't take care of it, basically the guy from upstairs moves in downstairs. Today we're going to start off with a bunch of questions. How exactly does that work? Does the does the owner have to move out? Because you know, in theory, they were supposed to live alone. Now what? They have to share a house. So we'll get back to that. Um, then Rabbi Yossi came along and said that they split the cost, okay? The, the floor and the ceiling, right? Because there's a ceiling, which also functions as the floor for the upstairs person. So even though he's renting, still, right, rent, people who rent are responsible for certain things in their house, and therefore, the, the part of the boards, which basically makes the base of the, of the ceiling, is the responsibility of the guy below. That's his main ceiling. But the... The, the clay or the plaster that goes kind of in between to make sure that it's all sealed properly, that's really the responsibility of the guy upstairs. And today we're going to figure out why Rabbi Yossi holds that way. But first we're going to get off on questions, a slew of questions, to which, as we know from the Gemara, often we don't actually have answers to any of these questions. We're going to end with a teku by Rabbi Abba bar Last few words of Daf Kufitet Zayin. Rabbi Abba bar asks the question, Kishuhudar, do when the, when the person from upstairs moves downstairs, does he live alone like he did before? In other words, you rent a house. You didn't rent a house to share it with the owner. So does the guy who's living upstairs come downstairs and, and the balabayat has to go find somewhere else to live? Or, or perhaps where they both live together downstairs. Why? Because the landlord could say, I didn't rent you my house so that you could kick me out of my house. So perhaps they could both live together. In Tim Salomer, if you want to say, which means we don't have an answer to this question, but if you want to go with the answer that, and, and the Rambam always says that when this happens, we actually pask in that way. Okay, in other words, it's, it's the Gemara's way of kind of saying, well, or at least it's the Rambam's way of saying, that must be an indicator we're holding this way. If you want to say, that they both live together in the house, now, when the guy from upstairs goes downstairs to live, does he get to go in every day through the front door, the same entrance used by the other person? Or does he or she have to go climb upstairs? Okay, they would have a ladder on the side of the house that would get them up to their attic, their you know, second floor. And then, where there's a hole, put a ladder and climb down. Okay, and this is, I guess, you know, when you think of there's people who live in houses or two family houses that both are on the same floor and there's separate entrances, right? In other words, do we keep a little bit of separation here and you have to have a separate entrance? Now, there is no separate entrance. 
So what we have to do is, well, go through your own property. So yeah, there's a hole in the ground, but at least use that to get to your space. Mi amar, so here are the two sons. Do we say, kidami ikara, mami ikara derech agin, ashanami derech agin. The owner could say, look, you know, yes, I have to give you some space in my house, but I don't have to let you come through my front entrance. You're going to go like you did before, through the attic. Oh, Dilma Matze Amarle, Aliya Kabili Alai, Aliya Virida, Lo Kabili Alai. The person upstairs could say, Listen, I was willing to walk up a flight of stairs to get to my house, but I'm not willing to walk up a flight of stairs and down a flight of stairs. And forget it, it's not even a flight of stairs. Forget that there's no elevator, right? There's not even stairs, it's a ladder. Can you imagine having to bring in all your produce, you know, carrying up the ladder, then down the ladder? That wasn't part of the deal. And another Imtim Siloma. Imtim Tzilomar, if you want to say, Matze Amar Le'aliyah V'yerida Lo Kabi Really, let's assume you could use the main entrance because it's unreasonable to assume that the guy took upon himself to go up and down, right? And you could say, I definitely don't, didn't want to do that. That wasn't part of our deal from the beginning and you can't make me work harder to get to my house. But what if there's Shte Aliyotzo Al Gavzo? What if there's a three-story house? I don't know if they actually really had three-story houses in those days, but let's say there was one. Mahu. Now, I'm going to give a few scenarios. Whose house was ruined and what the story is. Ifrit el Yona, nachit vidar betachtona. So now, if, let's say, you live downstairs and you rent out the two upper floors. And the upper, upper floor, right, the third floor, has a hole in it. So, the guy doesn't need to move in with you. You move him in with the guy one flight down. Ifrit tachtona, but if the second floor guy ends up with a hole, can you move that person up to the third floor? Can you say, listen, you accepted upon yourself to go up, so what? Go up another floor. Or maybe maybe he only accepted to go up one flight, right? When you go to rent an apartment, you always pay attention to how many flights of stairs are there to get to your apartment, right? When I lived in Jerusalem in a third floor walk up with no elevator, I really could relate to this, right? The third floor was pretty tough to get up there all the time with little kids and pregnant and all that, right? It, every extra flight added, you know, more energy, especially with carrying groceries. Oh, Dilma, or perhaps you could say, right? So, Khan Ali, I was willing to walk up one flight, but I'm not willing to walk up two flights. Vit and the Gemara ends with Teku. We don't know the answers to any of these questions. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Tachton Noten Etatikha. So now we're getting to this Machloket, Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with some other Machloket, a Machloket between two Amoraim, about something seemingly a little different, but seemingly very similar also. They're going to think that the Machloket is the same as our Mishnah. And we're going to understand the Machloket and our Mishnah very differently from the way we understood it, and then they're going to reject all that based on some machloket in Bava Batra. And then we're going to say, oh, actually, the machloket of the Amoraim is actually just like the machloket of Bava Batra, and our Mishnah has nothing to do with that. That's the structure of what we're going to do right now. If it wasn't helpful, because it's kind of talking about a structure before you've even seen it, don't worry, we'll review when we get to the end. My Tikra. So first, we just have to understand one basic thing before we get into the main sugya. What are we talking about? The bottom guy gives the tikha and the upper guy does the maziva. What's considered the tikha and like what's the, the responsibility for what parts is on the bottom guy, even according to Rabbi Yossi? So Rabbi Yossi Barchanina Amar Kinim Usnaim, which seemed to be besides the big beams they would put, they also put a mat, like a, a mat in between. And then on the mat, it was so that there was a place for the plaster, you know, they would then plaster it to keep it in place would go on top of that mat. So that mat, besides the beams underneath of the roof, also the mat is the responsibility, even according to Rabbi Yossi, of the downstairs person. Ustini, I'm a Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. Some people think Ustini is a Chacham. Some people have other interpretations of what this is, but let's just go with his Chacham. Send the name of Rish Lakish. Levachim. Okay, Levachim are, um, are planks. So they would put wooden planks. Okay, it seems like not such a whatever machloket. And in fact, the Gemara says, there's actually really no machloket here. Markiatre, markiatre. Each one was describing what was normally done in their, in their city, what was used. Okay, obviously, right? We know there's different customs used different materials in different places. So that's all. Right, now we get to this other case. 
Hanu Beitre, there were two people to have a diary, Chad Aliyah, Eli, and Chad Tatai. We have two people, one living in the house, one living in the Aliyah. Now, we've already seen a bunch of different cases like this. Sometimes it's landlord and tenant, sometimes it's just two different people. Now we're talking about two different people, not related in any, you know, they're not landlord tenant. They're just two people, they could be related, they could be two brothers who inherited a house, and one's upstairs, one's downstairs. Doesn't really matter. We have two people living, one upstairs, one downstairs. Ifrit Maziva. Now the plaster that was in the floor starts wearing away. Kimashe Mai Eli, and when the upper guy, now anyone who lives in an apartment probably has once in a while come up with this, with, has been part of this kind of situation. Well, when he pours water, because the plaster started wearing away, the water starts dripping down into the apartment of the guy below. Right? This happens a lot in apartment buildings. There's a leak in someone's apartment and it goes into someone else's apartment. Okay, hopefully you've never dealt with it, but many people I know have dealt with this where all of a sudden there's water coming into your house from someone else's apartment. So in parentheses, I have here Mima Taken. It's a parentheses, which means it doesn't really belong here in the text. Either which way, that's obviously what they're addressing. Who is responsible to fix the hole? Now you say, what's the question? Of course, the guy upstairs has a problem in his floor, right? Of course, he has to fix it. But remember, the floor is also part of the other person's ceiling. And perhaps there's another issue which we're going to see. And a surprising opinion, I would say. Rabbi Chiyabar, which we'll learn a lot more about in Baba, Baba Batra. Rabbi Chiyabar Abba Amal, Hel Yom Metaken. So Rabbi Chiyabar Abba says very simply, the guy upstairs obviously has to fix the leak so that the water doesn't go dripping down to the neighbor. Rabbi Eli, Mishum Rabbi Chiyabar, Rabbi Yossi Omer, Hatach Tom Metaken. Rabbi Eli in the name of Rabbi Yossi, remember Yossi, because this is going to be how we're going to remember who says what, says the lower guy has to fix it. Okay, If you don't want water dripping into your house, you deal with it. This siman, and the way you remember, this is Yosef, the Yosef who rab Mitzrayim. Okay, everyone knows Joseph went down to Egypt, and right, he was brought down to Egypt. Down, Yosef, oh, that's how you remember, Yosef, Yossi, Rabbi Yossi, or really it wasn't Rabbi Yossi, it was Rabbi Chia, the son of Rabbi Yossi, but that's because remember both guys were Rabbi Chia, that, that's why he says that it's down, or not, that's, that's not why, it's just how you remember who says what. Now the question is, what's the root of this debate? Lema Rabbi Chia bar Abba Rabbi Eli, which who quotes the name of Rabbi Chia bar Yossi, Bipluta de Rabbi Yossi for Rabbanan Kamiflage. Oh, this sounds just like our Machloket. Because Rabbi Yossi says when it comes to the Maziva, who's responsible? The upper guy. I'm sorry, the lower guy. Uh, sorry, Rabbi, right. Rabbi Yossi says the upper guy. And, and Chachamim say the lower guy. So what do you see here? It's the same Machloket. Laman de Amar, and what's the root of the Machloket? Now we're going to learn. Again, this is really not the reason for the Machloket in the mission, but right now they think it is. Laman de Amar ha'al yomitaken. If you say, it's the person living upstairs who needs to fix the situation. It's because you say, if you're causing damage to someone else, it's your responsibility to fix the damage. Right? Even though you don't really care. Because who cares you have a little bit of a hole in your floor, you know, the plaster's wearing away. It might look a little ugly, but you don't really care. But the fact that it's damaging someone else, that puts the onus on you. The one who says that the person downstairs needs to fix it, which is the Tanakhama in our Mishnah, and Rabbi Chia Bar Abba in the, in, the, in the debate between the Amoraim, this sounds like an interesting opinion. It means if one is causing damage to the other, well, if you're living downstairs and there's a leak coming from upstairs, the burden is on you to fix it. You have to fix the problem. Meaning, really, if you want to fix the problem, well, you should fix it. Since it's bothering you and it's not bothering them, you don't, they don't really have any responsibility to fix it. It's on you. And that's why the rabbis in our Mishnah say, the downstairs person needs to fix the whole ceiling, including the maziva, the plastering, because even though, right, if, if there's, now, that means that our Mishnah, which we didn't think, and, and eventually we're not going to say this is, is really concerned about damages. We didn't think it was concerning damages. We were talking about that the upper guy doesn't have a floor to step on, and, and right? We weren't really talking about damages, but that's what they were thinking. To which the Gemara says, wait, if you're going to say that this is how it divides, and you can look at the chart and see it on the, on the sheet, but it divides like this. If you say, in the case of the water dripping down, that it's the 
responsibility of the person upstairs, which is like saying, Rabbi Yossi in our mission, it's the responsibility of the upstairs person to fix the plastering. Then you say, the person who's causing damage needs to fix the problem. And if you hold it's the downstairs person, then you hold it's on the niz- the nizak. If you're getting damaged, well, you fix it so that you don't have damage in your property. But that means Rabbi Yossi says you have to watch what you do to your neighbor, and Tanakama doesn't care. Now in Baba Batra and Daf Kafham Ubet, we're going to have this machloket exactly head on, not like in our mission where it's not so clear. This is the machloket, and the opinions are switched. It's Rabbi Yossi who says. You can do whatever you want in your house. You don't have to worry about what damage is causing to anyone else. And it's the rabbis who say you have to worry about the damage. So to say that that's our Mishnah will come out that their opinions are totally opposite what they say in Baba Batra. So let's read that now. And the Gemara says like this, Wait a minute. Our Mishnah is talking about damages, right? Our Mishnah wasn't talking about damages. Our Mishnah was talking about landlord tenant the landlord have to fix the floor in the tenant's house and maybe the tenant needs to pay for part of it but it wasn't we weren't referring to damages that the tenant's house was causing a leak into the landlord's property and that's number one number two and if you say it is damages then our mission would totally contradict the mission of baba batra let's learn about the mission now and what this mission is really talking about is how much do I have to worry about potential future damage I might cause my neighbor? If I have a tree and you have a, a, a cistern or a pit with water, I have to make sure that I distance my tree from your pit 25 cubits. So let's say your pit is there and I want to dig, I want to uh, plant a tree. And you know, even though that's in your territory, this is in my territory, I have to be aware that you have a boar there and I have to make sure to move away my tree from your boar at least 25 cubits because otherwise my roots will basically ruin your boar. Bacharuvu b'shikma, if it's a caribor or a sycamore tree where the roots are, go much farther, I have to distance it 50 cubits. We'll get to this, we get to the mission, whether it's higher up or lower or, or, or on the side, still the roots will get there. Now, if the boar was there first and I put my tree there anyway, what do we say? Since my tree will cause you future damage, you can cut down my tree, you can insist. You do have to compensate me. We'll talk about this when we get there. These are all side points right now for our purposes. But if the tree was there first and then you decided to dig a boar, that's not my problem. You should have thought about making sure your boar is not in my territory. Lo yakots, you can't cut my tree down. Safek zekadam, safek zekadam. They're quoting way too much of this Mishnah for our purposes, but if it's a safek, lo yakots, if you're not sure which came first, we don't cut it down. Okay, but the main point that Tanakama says is, I can't put a tree, I have to prevent myself from causing damage to your property. Even though, right, I'm in my own property, but I still have to be aware of potential damage I might cause my neighbor. Rabbi Yossi Omer, I don't care if your boar was there first. It doesn't matter. I could do whatever I want. If I planted my tree, we don't cut it down. He says everyone's free to do in their own property whatever they want and don't have to worry about possible future damage. So what do you see here? Rabbi Yossi is of the extreme opinion that who cares what, what, you, what damage you might cause your neighbor, which would mean that in our case, if Rabbi Yossi holds in our Mishnah, the upper guy has to fix the plaster, and it's because of damages that they might damage the neighbor, that's not, that doesn't fit, right? It's the opposite. And the rabbis who say you have to worry about damages certainly wouldn't say in our Mishnah if it was about damages that it's the bottom guy who has to take care of it because... Obviously, the person on top is the one causing damages. They would have to fix it. So it's very hard to say that that's the machloket in our Mishnah. And in fact, what they're now going to, how did we start? We started with the machloket between two Amoraim about there's a hole in the floor and the water is going down. Who needs to fix it, right? And we said, oh, the root of their machloket, now we're going to say, we thought it was based on Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in our Mishnah. Turns out we were wrong. And in fact, it's based on Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in the Mishnah in Bava Batra because it's exactly lines up. 
There you actually have an exact lineup. You could, by the way, imagine how they got confused about this because, first of all, the case is very similar to Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in terms of someone living upstairs, someone living downstairs, as opposed to a tree and a boar. And they heard Rabbi Yossi rabbis, that's what they remembered, so they connected it to this by accident. But really, it's connected to the other sukkah, and that's what the Gemara is going to say right now. So first of all, they say, once you have the Mishnah Baba Batra, it's clear that Amar Rabbi Yossi Savar Alani Zaklar Chiketatzmo if you're worried about getting damaged by your neighbor, well, then you should fix the problem. And Rabbanan Savrayalamazikla, if you're damaging your neighbor, then you should be the one to fix the problem. So, if you want to connect the machloket and say that Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis disagree about the same thing that Rabbi Chia Bar Abba and Rabbi Chia Bar Rabbi Yossi are arguing about, their machloket must be the same as the machloket in Baba Batra. And that works perfectly. So now we're left with two things. First thing we have to do is, so what's the machloket in our Mishnah then? Rabbi Yossi v'Rabbanan dehacha b'may pligi. What's the root of their machloket? Bechozek tikra kamifluge. What they're really arguing about is the strengthening of the, of the ceiling and the floor. Basically what they want to know is this. Rabbanan savre maziva achzuke tikrahu. What's the point of plastering your ceiling slash the floor of the other person? The point is, to strengthen your ceiling, really. That's the main purpose. Now, if the main purpose is to strengthen your ceiling, well, whose ceiling is it? The person who lives downstairs. And therefore, since the plaster is coming apart, now, again, this is a landlord-tenant situation, and we all know that if you have a contract with, with a landlord or with a tenant, so there's a list of responsibilities. What the landlord's responsible for taking care of, what the tenant's responsible. So, the plaster coming about is really wear and tear. So theoretically, it could be on the tenant to pay. But since it's also functioning as strengthening the ceiling, and the main purpose, according to one opinion, is it's strengthening the ceiling, that's why the rabbis say it's the responsibility of the person downstairs. But Rabbi Yossi Safar, Mazivash, Yegumotu. No, the reason you plaster the floor is to flatten out the floor for the people walking on it. It's not so much for the ceiling, even though maybe it functions, it's also strengthening the ceiling. But the main purpose is to get your floor more even. And therefore, Rabbi Yossi says it's the responsibility of the person upstairs. And that's the machloket between them. Okay, so we're good. We only have one last thing, which is going to kind of raise a big question here, which is, wait a minute. In the end, what did we do? We took this machloket of two amoraim, about a different topic, about damages. We tried to compare it to our Mishnah. We said, no, no, our Mishnah is not relating to damages. And if it was, it would be the flipped. Okay, the opinions would be flipped based on this Mishnah Baba Batra. Then we said, oh, well, then let's just say that the Mishnah, that the, the debate between the Amorim is exactly lined up with the Mishnah Baba Batra. Whose responsibility? Nizak or Mazik, right? Which neighbor is responsible? The one who's being damaged or the one who's damaging? And that works perfectly, except that it doesn't really work perfectly because... Ini, is that really true that these machlokot line up? Rav Ashi said that when I was in the house of Rav Kahana, they said, Mo de Rabbi Yossi begeri delay. Even though Rabbi Yossi says you can do whatever you want in your house, I don't care if it's bothering your neighbor. That's their problem. But not if, and this makes a lot of sense all of a sudden, because it's a very hard opinion to, to go by, right? Obviously, if you're, you're, your neighbor's, you know, there's water dripping into your house from your neighbor. It seems weird to say it's not their responsibility. So, Rabbi Yossi agrees, begeri delay. What's geri delay? If you have direct, okay, this goes back to Bavakama and Nizikin and all these things we learn. There's grama, which is indirect damages. And then there's geri delay, which is, it's like shooting arrows. Where if an arrow is shooting right at you, it's going to damage you. So, what he means is, if it's really direct damages, which is, your neighbor pours water on the floor and it goes right into your house and causes damage. Even Rabbi Yossi thinks, okay, we, we don't go that far. Of course, your neighbor needs to fix it. So how could you possibly say there's a machloket here? All the Tanaim say in this kind of case, you'd have to be able to, you'd have to fix it. To which they answer, it's some kind of indirect damage where the water kind of goes, doesn't go down directly. We all know this how water works, right? It seeps into the ground and then eventually water collects there and eventually it starts dripping down. That's already indirect damages, and then Rabbi Yossi would say you're not responsible. And then it goes into what we've learned about grama, you know, and the indirect damages you're not liable for, and perhaps that's, you know, that explains Rabbi Yossi a little better. 
Okay, that's the end of that sugya. Now we're moving on to a new Mishnah. Again, a bayef aliyah, but every time you have to clarify, are we talking about landlord-tenant? No, here we're talking about two different people. Again, it could be brothers who inherited the same house. It could be just two people who each bought different parts of the house. Habayef aliyah shoshnaim shenaflu. And now the house falls apart, collapses, total, complete collapse. Amar bal aliyah la bal abayet note. Now the guy who lives upstairs says, I want to live here. But what, I can't live here without there being a bottom floor. But who we know what say leave note? But the person downstairs can't afford to build, rebuild the house or doesn't want to, maybe has another place to live, doesn't want to be bothered, isn't interested. So now the Baal Aliyah, the person living upstairs is stuck. Where do they have to live? They can't live in the air, right? And they don't own the airspace of the downstairs. So according to Tanakama, the person living upstairs builds the downstairs, and when the owner, the original owner of the downstairs, is ready to move back in, they compensate the downstairs person, the, well, the upstairs person who's now living downstairs, they compensate them for what they spent, and then the person living downstairs moves upstairs, okay? The person who was originally living upstairs moves from downstairs to upstairs. Obviously, they're going to end up having to work, you know, for someone like me who hates doing renovations, right? Unfortunately, they're stuck doing renovations twice, but that's their prerogative. They want to live in a house now, so they first live downstairs. As soon as the original owner wants to come back, they pay for the for all the expenses that the person put out for building that the upstairs person put out for building the downstairs and now the person can build the upstairs. Rabbi Yehuda Omel, So now exactly what you're asking, Becky, which is Rabbi Yehuda says, wait a minute, that's like a squatter. That person is living in someone else's space. So of course they have to pay them rent. In which case, this isn't a good solution, because that seems really unfair. So Rabbi Yehuda suggests, in order to avoid the paying rent, here's a different idea. Now, why do you have to pay rent? And this goes back to famous Sugim Baba Kama, Daf Kaf, Chasel, right? The person from upstairs who's living now downstairs is benefiting, because they don't have anywhere else to live, so they're benefiting. And Zelo Chaser, well, the bottom person is not missing anything, because they... Or they, they could live there if they want, but they don't want to. So they're not taking any loss. This is just like a squatter. Now, it seems clear from here, not everybody thinks that a squatter would have to pay. Some people think you don't have to pay. It sounds like Rabbi Yudah is saying you have to pay. So what does he suggest? I'm saying it seems that way because later we're going to understand Rabbi Yudah differently. So now they say, okay, the person living upstairs actually builds the entire thing which is a little unfair. They have to have money to be able to build a house and the second floor. Mekaret el has to put a cover, right, a ceiling on the top, meaning make it inhabitable. Once it's inhabitable, then Then they can live downstairs until the person pays them back. Now, why would they live downstairs? First of all, I guess it's easier, but it's not even that. Because that would be a benefit. We're going to see. You have to neutral. You have to get, say there is no benefit. Why is there no benefit? Because they could live upstairs. Now, why are they living downstairs? Because the only incentive to get the person to give them their money back is to live in their space, so that you know the guy will, uh, the the original owner will eventually come back and say, "Hey, get out of my house." So they want to incentivize that person to paying them to reimbursing them. But the main point is, we now turn it into a case of zelone hene vezelo chasel. This person is not benefiting and that person's not losing anything because they're not benefiting because they could be living upstairs. That's the way we understand Rabbi Yehuda right now. And what we're going to focus on right now is Rabbi Yehuda because comes Rabbi Yochanan turning out on the bet. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, b'shlosha mekomot shana lanu Rabbi Yehuda, asur la'adam shiehene mimamon chavero. Rabbi Yochanan now comes and says, I'm going to take three Mishnayot, one above a Kama, one above a Metziah, one above a Batra. And the one above Metziah is uh, Baba Kama should be very familiar to you at this point. I'm going to take three opinions of Rabbi Yehuda that appear in these Mishnayot. And I am going, even the one in Baba Batra we learned, if I remember correctly. I'm going to take these three opinions and I'm going to show you that there's a common thread through all three of them. And they're all based on a person is not allowed to benefit from someone else's money, someone else's property without Right, without their knowledge or without their consent, like a squatter. 
okay? Which basically means, in other words, right? You can't, well, it could mean this. In our case, it will mean this. If you benefit and the other person is not losing anything, you still can't do it because you're not allowed to benefit from anyone else's money or property. So how do we see this? The way the structure of this Gemara is going to work is, first, we're going to take the three Mishnahs. We're going to show how they all mean this. And then the Gemara is going to reject this entire thing and say, not our Mishnah, not the other Mishnah, and not the third Mishnah have anything to do with this topic. And they all are for different reasons entirely. Rabbi, Yo, Rabbi Yudah's opinion in each of the Mishnayot each time has to do with something entirely different. And therefore, this theory of Rabbi Yochanan is rejected. So, so if while I'm explaining it, you say, hey, when we learned this, it's not exactly how we explained it, don't worry, because that's eventually what we're going to say. So let's go through. Chada haditnan. Okay, so the first is obvious, it's ours. Okay, our Mishnah clearly, if the, what we're really talking about is the first line of Rabbi Yehuda, <clears throat> that if you were to just build the, the downstairs and live there, the upstairs person couldn't live downstairs because they're benefiting from someone else's property and you can't benefit from someone else's property without paying for it. Okay, that's simple. Idach mahi, what about, and what's the other case or, you know, case number two. Ditznan, and this is a mission we learned many, many times. Hanotain semer la You took your wool to the dyer and you asked them to dye it red and they dyed it black. Or shahor adom. You wanted it black, they dyed it red. Rabbi Meir Omer notain lo demet samro. So Rabbi Meir says basically you give them the value of the wool and you get, right? So according to Rabbi Meir, basically the person who dyed it acquires the wool. They keep the wool and gives you back the value of the wool that you that you gave them. So basically you're left back where you were and they end up with the dyed wool. Now that would mean, the way we're going to view it right now is that you can benefit from someone else's items, right? You took their item, you ruined it, and now you get to keep it. It's a little weird. Rabbi Yehuda Omeo, right now, if you remember, we call it Rabbi Meir said it's because you're like a thief and a thief acquires it and just has to return the value at the time of the theft. Rabbi Yehuda Omeo, no, we don't do that. You don't get to keep it. You give it back to the person, okay? Because, what are we going to assume? Why do you give it back? Because you can't benefit from someone else's stuff. So if you're the dyer who died it wrong, you have to give it back. And the question now is just, do we compensate you at all for your work? So the way Rabbi Yudah says it is, we're going to compensate you the least possible amount. So in the end, the original owner does get back something that's increased in value. Because even though they wanted it red, now it's black but it's still increased in value and you spent money on it. So Rabbi Yehuda says, We evaluate how much did you, what were your expenses and how much it went up in value. And whichever is less, that's what I have to pay for. Okay, so if the expenses were less and it's now worth more than that, I just pay you the expenses. If it didn't go up much in value and you actually spent more money than it went up, then I only pay you the amount it went up in value. Okay, but no way can you benefit from it, and therefore that's exactly the same idea. The the third one, Ditnan says in a Mishnah, Misha para mikzat chovo. You lent me a hundred dollars. I paid fifty dollars. He shlish et Now we're a little bit stuck here because we want you're going to keep the straw that says I owe you a hundred. But if you do that, I really only owe you fifty, right? We don't want to rip up the straw because I still owe you money. So, and if we rip it up, then remember all the lean property won't be leaned anymore. So we're a little bit stuck. What do we do? We don't want to rip it up, right? We could put a shovar, like a receipt next to it, but what if the receipt gets lost, right? So I don't have a good way to protect myself. So what do we do? We give it to a shalish. Shalish etchtaro. Shalish comes from the language of three, like a third wheel, a third person. We give it to someone else, which is really like an agent. We give it to a third party. They hold the star. And then they remember that I paid half. That's their responsibility, basically. So that way, you know, it's not like if I kept the star, the one who borrowed the money, you would have no way to collect it ever. If you kept the star, you could collect the whole thing. So we give it to a third party. Okay, so far, so good. But if I said to that, to both you and the, the person holding the star, Va'amarlo, im ein ani noten zman ploni, I promise you I'm going to pay this loan back by July 1st. And I say, if not, then lo shtaro. I say to the shalish, if I, do, I say to both of you, if I don't pay the loan back by July 1st, then give the star back to the, the to you, 
the creditor, which means that you can now collect $100 from me because you now have a star without any sort of receipt. Higia zman velo natan, and if, in fact, the time came and I didn't, July 1st came and went, and I didn't pay my bill, Rabbi Yossi Omer Yitin, Rabbi Yossi says, well, I said, give it back. You can give it back. Okay, the, the person, give it back to you. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, lo Yitin. Rabbi Yehuda says, no way, no how. Why? Because you're going to get something for nothing. You're going to now be able to collect $100 when I only owe you 50 So, of course, we don't give it back. And that's because you can't benefit from my money for no reason even though I promised it, but not. Okay, now what we have to do is undo everything we just did, which is explain that each of those Mishnayot has nothing to do with what we think it has to do with, Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Am I? Why? And now each one's going to have its own reason. Let's go back to our Mishnah. Our Mishnah we thought was a case, we thought, was a case of Zenehene, I benefit from living downstairs, Vizelo Chaser, and you who's really the owner of the downstairs space, is not losing out because you weren't going to live there anyway. And Rabbi Yehuda says, in that case, I'd have to pay you rent. So the only solution is I have to build both floors and then I'm not benefiting. But no. They're now going to say, Dilma Ag Khan, you got the case all wrong. Dilma Ag, it's not Zenehene Vezelo Chaser. We're going to now say it's Zenehene Vezeh Chaser. I am actually causing you to lose out. Why is that? Because maybe Rabbi Yehuda only said it there. There's blackening of the walls. I build you a brand new house, but I'm using it. And when I use it, the walls are going to turn black because when I use my oven in your house, it turns the walls black. So when you come five years later and you pay me the money for all the expenses I spent on the house, I take out all my bills and you reimburse me, you're getting a house that's not worth what it was five years ago. It's worth less now because the walls are blackened. It's not a huge difference, but it is a difference. So that turns it into a case, let's just get the lingo right, of I'm benefiting, and you're losing. It's not a squatter where you're not planning on living in the house. No, it'd be a squatter where you were planning on living in the house because you're actually losing out. But if it was zelo chaser, which it isn't, then Rabbi Yehuda would say, oh, no problem, perhaps, right? That's what we're assuming. Okay? And then, again, what do you have to say? Now you have to make a jump. So what was Rabbi Yehuda's solution? You have to understand the whole mission now, according to this. Rabbi Yehuda's solution was, let's turn it into a case where I'm not benefiting. And now you have to say, you have to make another jump, which is, if I'm not benefiting because I could live upstairs, however, I am still causing you damage, right? Zechaser. Doesn't matter. Because as long as I'm not benefiting, because I could be living upstairs, I could live in your house even if it's causing damage to you because I'm not really benefiting. And as, as long as I'm not getting benefit, I don't have to pay, even if theoretically I'm depreciating the value of your house. Okay, so that explains Rabbi Yehuda, which has not, and then Zene Chaser, we could say squatter, regular case of a squatter, doesn't have to pay even according to Rabbi Yehuda. And then that's against what we thought Rabbi Yehuda was saying, which is you can never benefit from someone else's stuff without paying. Inami mishum kamashane. What was the problem with the dyer? If you dyed my wool the wrong color, you can't keep the dye, the, the dyed wool. Why? Because we learned in the Mishnah, anyone who changes, who doesn't do what they're supposed to do, you were sent on a mission and you, you messed up. You decided on your own volition to just change what I told you to do. Well, then you always have the, the under, your, I have the upper hand because you changed. And that's why we're beautiful rules that way. That's why I get my wool and I just pay the, the least amount of money possible. That's a totally different reason. It has nothing to do with our topic. And if you didn't remember this, you'll remember now. You should know that by now, which is, this is a classic asmachta case. When I said, if I don't pay you by July 1st, take back the shar and I'll pay you the whole thing. Why would I ever commit to doing that? I don't really mean what I say. Now, you might remember, why does Rabbi Yossi say we can do it and you can then collect the entire amount? Because Rabbi Yossi has a unique opinion about Asmachta. Rabbi Yossi all the Asmachta works. Okay? But Rabbi Yehuda holds Asmachta lo kane. Shamina le Rabbi Yehuda damar lo kane. It was a complete exaggeration. I never meant what I said. I was only trying to convince you that don't worry, I'll pay you the money. So I made some silly exaggerated statement, but I never meant it. And that's why it doesn't work. It has nothing to do with what we thought. So that was the first part of our Mishnah, which was dealing with the Rabbi Yehuda opinion, trying to understand it, thinking it meant one thing, realizing and thinking that all these other Mishnah meant one thing in the end, 
there is no real connection between these three Mishnayot. They each reflect different opinions of Rabbi Yehud about different issues. Amar Rav Acha Bar Adam Ishmei Ula. So Rav Acha Bar Adam says the name of Ula. Tachton Habala Shano. Now we're talking about the house collapse and the rebuilding the house. And now we're going to learn that the person living downstairs, when they want to rebuild, has to rebuild it in at least the same way, if not a better way, that it was built before in the way that it will affect the upper person. And the upper person has to be conscious of what they're doing and how it's going to affect the lower person. Now, what does this mean? We're going to learn about all different sizes of bricks. So there's Gvil, Gazit, Ksifin, and Levenim. Okay, let's start with Levenim. Levenim are bricks that are three Tfachim wide. Ksifin are half bricks. So they're one and a half Tfachim wide, but when you put them together, you add some cement in between and they become four Tfachim wide. So instead of being three, they're now going to be four. Gazit are hewn stones, so they're narrower, okay, but they're stones, so they're wider than the bricks. They're usually six tfachim, but once they're hewn, they're down to five. And gvil is wider, they're six, they're unhewn stones. So now, the way it's going to work is like this. The downstairs person, the wider they make their walls, the better it is for the person upstairs, because there's more support, more wide walls, more support for the upstairs. So Bigvil, if they want to change from Gazit to Gvil, it was five tfach and they want to make it six, Shomilo, they can do that because they're only making it better for the upstairs person. But Bigazit, if it was Gvil to begin with, and now the house fell apart and he wants to use the, the unhewn, the, he wants to use the hewn stones, which are narrower, and Shomilo, he can't. Bigfisin, to use the half, the half bricks, is actually better than the single bricks because the half bricks end up with a four tfach in width, four hand breaths width. So Bikfisin, if you want to change it to Kfisin, Shominlo, you can do that. Bilavenim in Shominlo. But if you want to use the bricks, which are three only, you can't because that's going to be too narrow. Lisakech ba'arazim Shominlo. If you want to put for your ceiling now, now again, your ceiling is the floor of the other person. So you want to put these very solid cedar wood planks when before maybe it was just sycamore. So you can do it better. But Bishkamim ain't Shominlo. If you want to use sycamore, which is not as strong, they break more easily. You can't because it's the floor of the other person. It's going to break more easily. Lema'epa chalanot have less windows, shomin lo, because less windows means more strong walls. Right? Windows are basically just holes in the wall. Laharbot bechalanot to make more windows ain't shomin lo, because again, it's going to make it weaker for the person living upstairs for their walls that are based on your walls that are now weaker. Lahagbiya, if you want to make your walls taller, ain't shomin lo, because now this person is going to have to walk up more steps on their ladder to get back to, the, to, get to their house. Okay, now we're going to do the reverse. Everything except the last one is going to be flipped because now the thicker the wall is upstairs, the more pressure it puts on the walls downstairs and it ruins, right? It's going to cause their house to fall apart quicker. So, so it's all, all, all the reverse, okay? I don't, I'm not going to go through each one because it's obvious, right? The, the narrower it is, the better it is. And even the ceiling is better to have a weaker ceiling because, again, the ceiling weighs on the walls. But, right, so less windows is better, less heavy on the wall. But the only one thing that's the same is making it taller because a taller wall will be heavier again on the person living downstairs, right? But if you want to make shorter walls, of course, you can do that. That's better for the person downstairs. What if What if neither has the money to spend on redoing the house? So now, what happens with the land? Do they share the land? Who has what part in the land? Now, really, the person downstairs has more rights to the land because they live on the land. The person upstairs sort of has the land. So, in fact, there's a bright here in quotes that most people take out uh, in parentheses, which means it's not in the regular version, although some people, the Rif has it in his version in the Gemara. But there it says, actually, that the person living upstairs has zero rights to the land. But, Tanya, we're now going to quote a bright with two other opinions. Rabbi Natan Omer Tachton Notel Shnei Chalakim Halyon Shlish. The person upstairs gets a third of the land. Achirim, my mother, say, that the upper person only gets a quarter of the land. Rabbi says, you should hold by Rabbi Natan. He's a judge, and he really knows the, the ins and outs of the judgment, of judgment, of rulings. Okay, you can think about this connection. It's a little bit of a hard connection, but what they say is, 
a house that has a, a second floor is going to deteriorate at a, at a rate of one third, meaning if the house would have lasted 60 years, now that it has a second floor, it's only going to last 40 years, okay? It's going to be deteriorated. To, it's going to kind of, it's going to lower the life of the house by a third. So since there's this ratio of a third, we're going to say that means that, okay, again, it's a bit of a jump. That means that the person has a third rights to the land underneath. The person upstairs, since they cause a third of the depreciation in the house, they also have a right to a third of the land underneath. Okay, new Mishnah. This is very, very similar to the upstairs and the downstairs and the hole in the, in the floor. If I have a, an olive press, which is built into a rock or a mountain, a hill, something like that, and above it, on the, the roof of my, of my uh, olive press, there's a garden that belongs to somebody else. Vikina chat al gabav, that means the garden is growing up above. Vidif chat, and now my roof caves in, and now you have no place to plant your stuff. So hare bala gina, yorev is lamata, the person who has the garden upstairs can go onto the bottom of my, my olive press floor and use it for planting. Ad shi asela beit bado keepin, until I put a roof type of thing over my beit habad, over my olive press. A different case now. If my wall or my tree, we actually saw this case before, falls into the public domain and damages, it's my I'm exempt because I didn't do anything. It was just it fell. But but if the court came in and said, Hey, your wall's about to fall, your tree's about to fall, you better cut it down or break the wall, you know, fix it. If it's within the time frame they gave me, which we're going to see later in the Gemara, they give usually 30 days, then I'm patur, I'm exempt. But if the date passed and I didn't deal with it, then I'm chayav. Okay, the next case we'll, we'll start with tomorrow because it really continues much more into tomorrow's stuff. So what did we do today? We started with these questions about when you move downstairs, do you get to live together? Do you have to go up and down through your own entrance or not? What if there's three floors? We didn't have any answers. Then we went to compare this Machloka and Moraim somewhere else to the Machloka Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in her mission, and then said, no, 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 not at all. You got it all wrong. Our Machloka doesn't have to do with damages and water dripping down. Our Machloka has to do with who's really, who's, what's the, the plastering of the floor? Is it really for the floor or for the ceiling? And the Machloka and Moraim really has to do with Machloka Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis in Baba Batra, which really is all about damages and neighbors and who's responsible for what. Then we got to the, the if the house falls down and the person Upstairs wants to rebuild, but downstairs doesn't. How did they do it? From there, we got to Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, thinking that Rabbi Yehuda means something. Brought three other, right, two other places where we think Rabbi Yehuda all means that you can't benefit from your, someone else's property even if they don't care. We said that's not the case. Uh, we rejected it, each one for a different reason. And then we talked about when you rebuild this house, what does each one have to be sensitive to not to change in a way that will affect negatively the other person? We went through all those possibilities, and then we talked about this Beit Habad and about the tree and the wall falling into the public domain. With that, we finished for today. Don't forget to register for the Siyum, and don't forget that there's no class on Wednesday morning. On Thursday morning, we'll start Baba Batra, and on Wednesday night at the Siyum, or Wednesday night Israel time, we will, um, we will do the daf, the last daf of the Masechet. Wishing everybody a great day, and Shnishma B'Salat Tovot.